for that. So it is time to turn to part two of the program. And I saw that our honored guest, Stuart Schaffman, has arrived from Jerusalem, which is absolutely wonderful. And I think that this is the first time that Addis Israel and Bethel, the Bethel Book Clubs, have had the privilege of hosting the translator of one of the books that we've read. And for that, we thank Rachel Greenberg for connecting us to Stuart and Stuart for joining us. And now Rachel will introduce Stuart Schaffman, but just give me a minute to highlight you, Rachel, and then go ahead. So it's an enormous pleasure for me to introduce Stuart um, Schaffman, renowned journalist and translator. And I first met Stuart when we were in high school, we were high school students in Brooklyn at the Yeshiva Flatbush. And our classmates knew Stuart for his quick wit, intelligence and wisdom, assets we knew would serve him well in the future. After Flappers, uh, Stuart went on to earn degrees from Harvard and Yale, specializing in American history. And before making Aliyah and moving to Israel in 1988, Stuart worked as a journalist for Fortune and Time magazines in New York, and later as a Hollywood screenwriter. He has taught film at the University of Southern California and Tel Aviv University, and American history at the University of Texas. A columnist for the Jerusalem, Jerusalem Report for over 25 years, Stewart also wrote about Israeli and Jewish politics, history, and culture for Jewish publications in the United States. He continues to be a frequent contributor to the Jewish Review of Books. For many years, Stewart was a fellow at the, at the uh, Shalom Hartman Institute, a leading center for Jewish thought and education serving Israel and North America. As a translator of Israeli literature, Stewart's work includes books by notable authors, David Grossman, Meir Shalev, and Aharon Appelfeld, as well as four novels by A.B. Yehoshua, most recently, The Tunnel. So take it away, Stuart. Okay, here I am. And welcome. We're just so happy that well, you could join you. us. Thank, so much appreciated. You. Thank you so much. I, I look a little different from the photo that you ran um, uh, the, or that I sent. I, this is my, my, my plague beard. Um, and um, I, I, I don't know how many, I don't know how many men have taken the opportunity to, um, to let their hair grow. Um, but uh, this is me today, uh, a little bit older than the, than the previous picture. Um, anyway, I just want to say, that, first of all, that, that um, I'm going to refer to Aleph Bet Yehoshua, which is kind of a, a mouthful of a name, or A B Yehoshua, or Abraham B Yehoshua, by the name, the nickname that everybody knows him by in this country, and every but people call him that even if they've never met him, and that's Bully, and the B and A.B. Yehoshua stands for bully. It's a childhood nickname. It goes along with all the other uh, strange uh, uh, Hebrew nicknames of like uh, like uh, Bougie and uh, Bogey and uh, or Bibi for that matter. Um, and um, that's what everybody calls him. Actually, his real middle name um, is Gabriel. But he's been going by A.B. Yehoshua, Aleph Bet Yehoshua, for many, many years. And it's been a tremendous privilege um, to work with him. And um, I, uh, I, I got on a line here uh, into the Zoom a little bit early, and I heard some very inter interesting and intelligent comments, uh, perceptive comments, intriguing comments. So. I, I don't think I'm going to uh, just uh, yammer away for a half hour, but just give you a bit of a of, of a of a of a background, and then I'd like to just reopen it to questions and comments, and then I'll just weigh in in the same in the same conversation, if that's uh, if that's agreeable to all. That sounds perfect. Okay. All right. So. Uh, 
Anyway, Rachel, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And um, it was uh, always nice to see you uh, uh, in, in relatively recent years, although I have a feeling that a number of years have already gone by when you were, uh, when you were here for a year. And so thank you very much for arranging this. Um, the, uh, of the authors that I have translated, um, I've translated more of his books than anyone else. And as a matter of fact, he has a new book out, um, which has just now landed in the stores, even though the stores reopened as of today, more or less. We've been, we are the, um, the uh, um, uh, va vaccine rollout champions of the world. And we're also the, um, the uh, lockdown champions. We've had more lockdowns, more days of lockdown since uh, the plague began than any other country, a dubious, a dubious distinction. Anyway, as a new book, and here it is. I don't know if this is gonna come out reversed or not. Does this come out reversed? No, we see it like you see it. Okay, so you see the name of the book is Habat HaYechida which in Hebrew means what? What is the Habat? Only daughter. Habat? The, only the, only daughter. Daughter. the only daughter. But it also means the only child. Really? Because Hebrew is a gendered language. So somebody is either a Ben Yachid or Bat Yachida. And in this case, it is the only, um, uh, she is the only, uh, She's the only child, she's the only granddaughter. And it's, uh, this one is a, a new departure for Bully. It takes place, it's really a novella, it's a short novel, it takes place in Italy um, in the closing years of the 20th century. And it's about a mixed Italian family. And it's all about identity, Italian, Jewish, Catholic and so on. And a 12 year old girl who was dealing uh, with all of this. It's really uh, quite a wonderful book. And when it finally comes out uh, on a, a Kindle near you or wherever else you're going to be able to get hold of it, uh, it will probably come out. Uh, this is a, uh, under a different name, um, which is, um, it may well come out not as the only child, but as um, m uh, mother of God, because it's about a Jewish girl who is encouraged to take the part of the Madonna in the Christmas play in her school. And her father refuses to let her do it. And uh, all that, that, that happens uh, thereafter. The point is that I mentioned this because Bully is, no, first and foremost, and for so many years, for so many years, he has been really fixated on the idea of identity. And The Tunnel is a book that deals with identity from virtually the page one, um, where he is losing a grip on his own identity. And as the book progresses, um, his slip sliding into a different mental state becomes more pronounced. And you remember that, that amazing scene with the tattoo artist in the flea market in, uh, in Yafo, in Jaffa, where the guy says to him, no, it's a privilege, I'm not charging you anything. And when you want me to come and um, uh, uh, tattoo, you've forgotten your own name, I will happily tattoo it on you free of charge. I mean, it's really kind of, kind of eerie, needless to say, the whole business of having a number tattooed on your arm is something that, uh, that goes without saying, and he doesn't really belabor it as, you've, as you saw in the text, it's just part of, what is, it's part of the, of the overall picture of this man's 
uh, this man's identity. Now, I overheard before people were talking about how this book is all about marriage. And if you read the review in the New York Times, which was very generous and they, they, uh, they liked the book very, very much and recommended it highly, uh, the reviewer pointed out that this was really um, as much as anything a book about marriage and whether or not it came up in previous conversation. Um, you know that, uh, I'm sure that you've heard this, that, uh, that Bully's wife, Ika, which was a nickname for Rivka, uh, to whom he was married for 56 years, uh, died in, in the midst of his writing The Tunnel. You, did, you knew that, yes? Um, and this, and the book is really an homage to Ika. And in so many, it's dedicated to Ika, the eternal beloved. And she's there on every page. And she wasn't a, uh, uh, a pediatrician like, uh, like Dina in the book, but she was a, a psychotherapist and she studied psychoanalysis in Paris. And her psychological insights were really instrumental uh, to, Bully's, uh, to Bully's work. She, was, uh, she had an, a great influence on, on, on everything uh, that, that she wrote. And I, 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 I was very, very fond of her. Everybody liked Ika. And it was quite devastating um, when she died in the middle of this. And then uh, what happened was that one after another, a lot of Bully's friends passed away, um, which is something that just, um, you know, he, he's, he's 84. He turned 84 in December. Um, and another person to whom he was very, very, very close who died was Amos Oz. Um, and he and Amos Oz had... Um, a kind of a, um, an informal chavruta uh, where the three were with, with another writer also of the same vintage uh, named Yehoshua Kenaz. Uh, I don't know if his name came up in your previous conversation, but Yehoshua Kenaz was, uh, as opposed to Bully and, uh, and Amos Oz, Amos Oz, who, it, as it happens, I never met. Um, but Amos Oz and Bully were, uh, uh, and Bully still is public intellectuals. So when somebody commented before about how Bully had um, uh, kind of um, taken a different turn from where he was early on, the answer to that is yes and no. Um, he wrote a very uh, thoughtful, long piece in Hebrew uh, for Haaretz, in which he was talking about the what seems to be a the inevitability of a solution that may go beyond the two-state solution in which he believed all all these years. But what he says at the end of the piece is, "I hope that I'll be proven wrong, and if I am, and if somebody can show me how the two-state solution is going to work, um, I will follow them." Uh, uh, through fire and water. I will do everything I can to pursue that. But in case I can't, we have to be alert to other possibilities. And if we end up in a one state situation, then we really have to, to do everything we, we can to prevent it for Israel from becoming an apartheid state. Now, he would come out and say things like that. And Amos Oz, of course, was well known for it, but Kanaz was the opposite. Kanaz was, wasn't the Hebraman. Kanaz was a very private person. Kanaz never married. Kanaz never had children. And uh, he did not opine about the issues of the day. He just wrote his, his, um, his, his books. And he was also an acclaimed a translator into Hebrew from French. And what happened was that somewhere in the last decade, um, Yehoshua Kenaz uh, came down with early symptoms of, um, 
of dementia. Um, and um, it was progressive. And um, Bully was w observed what happened when Yehoshua Kanaz's dear friend was uh, uh, was diagnosed and and was uh, was entering that 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 world that 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 scary world that ultimately led to a complete disconnection of Kanaz. And in the last couple of years of his life, um, he really couldn't communicate with any of his old friends. But the important thing is that a lot of the humor that is almost unexpected in the tunnel derives from the early stages of Knaz's illness in which it was still possible for him to, um, to joke about his, about his condition. And um, uh, what's, what's really quite extraordinary about Bully is that no matter how um, serious the topic, he, um, he's always able uh, to derive uh, humor uh, from it and his, making his novels um, entertaining as well as um, powerful and illuminating and provocative and so forth. Um, in this book, as you have already undoubtedly commented in your discussion, it has everything to do with Israeli identity, with the vestiges of a common Semitic identity that may or may not be mythical. Um, the, the idea that, uh, that Yitzhak Ben Svi um, entertained the idea that the Palestinians were actually um, um, descended from the ancient Hebrews and that Ben Gurion was was quite uh, enchanted by this possibility. And here we had this very odd situation of this family in, in their very um, peculiar uh, uh, hideout um, in, in this old Nabataean ruin, which kind of pulls together a lot of threads uh, for Bully that he wants, uh, that he wants to explore. Um, the, the one thing that I would want to stress, and I, I guess the reason why I'm, um, uh, I, I assume you are all muted, which is why I'm not getting too many reactions, yay or nay to what I'm, what I'm saying, but I would like to get reactions very soon, um, is that, um, uh, he, he, uh, the book itself, in terms of its language, increasingly mirrors the ambiguity of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the thinking of Luria. In other words, you get the sense as the book progresses that the, there's a very fuzzy barrier between the narrator and the, or the, the, the narration, which is not a first person narration and the consciousness, even as it changes of, of Luria, so much so that the, um, that there is a sense in the text itself of a of the value of um, of the of, of of the of the 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 value of the ambiguity of of, of whether something is realistic or surrealistic. And they kind of slide one into the other. So when you come down to that ending, what I've often been asked is, what really happened here? 
did this really happen? Is, 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 is the Palestinian, you know, symbolically or actually shooting Luria the Tzvi? And if so, why? And what I would say to that is that Bully has never been fond of the tied up with a ribbon kind of ending. There's always kind of um, a sense, if any of you has read the, uh, the retrospective that has that extraordinary finale having to do with, with Don Quixote and, uh, and, um, and Dulcinea and so on, uh, and you get, you get the feeling of, you know, is, is this really happening? Is it a fantasy? And the same thing is really going on uh, in the last scene. And that I think that like many authors, he, if he, if he were present in this conversation right now, and you would ask him, but what did you mean by that? He would say, that's up to you. It's your, the, the writing of, of literary fiction in particular is a collaboration between the writer and the reader. And the readers are entitled to interpret it however they see fit and whatever works for them. The idea is, does, does it stimulate your thinking? In what way does it stimulate your thinking? And there's no real right or wrong, particularly in a book of this nature. In other words, that ending is so strange, is it not? How he is making that, that physical and symbolic descent back into the crater, which has so many symbolic um, resonances uh, in the book. But I think at this point, I'd just rather respond to particular questions. If anything, I said uh, kind of... Um, stimulated your, your, your thinking uh, about this, then please do, uh, please do let me know. Thank you so much, Stuart. That was um, really wonderful to, uh, to have some of your perspective and it makes reading the book all the richer.